All right, well, we do want to go ahead and get started letting people in. I'm here with the uh, beautiful uh, Mama Felicia. <laughs> um, let's see. All right, welcome, welcome. I know we were giving people a few minutes to get into the waiting room, but Sister Khadija, we're gonna move on uh, forward with you. And as other people join in, we had a couple of folks register um, this evening. I will do the introduction. We are recording this, so you have access to it. You can come back a little bit later. Um, watch the video recording for those who wanted to be here and for whatever reason could not be here. We do have this available. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to always introduce a dear sister, friend of mine, who's a leader in, in the agricultural space. Um, today we do have um, a beautiful presentation being done by um, my sister Felicia Bell. I'm going to do my absolute best with my, my screen today, my screen sharing, since I am um, using a different device. I hope that you all um, are fine with that. Felicia, do you mind if I um, share the flyer real quick? Okay. Um, I just want, want to make sure that I open it up um, really quickly. It's on my little bitty um, screen. I guess I'm gonna have to do this. Um, so today we have the pleasure of having uh, Felicia Bell. She'll be talking about food preservation and how to maximize the produce from wherever you're growing, right? Um, she is with RDNS Farm, um, based out of Mississippi. Um, she's been involved in agriculture all of her life, and she is a fourth generation farmer of her traditional farm legacy. Um, she was taught the responsibility of helping your fellow man and your neighbor, and that's exactly what she's doing here tonight, you all. She's donating and dedicating her time, wisdom, knowledge, and expertise with, with us. Um, so we are very thankful. I would strongly encourage you all to visit her website. I know she will share that with you at the end of this presentation, but do your absolute best to share um, resources, exchange knowledge, and then support her and the work that she's been doing. She's been continuing her grandfather's legacy of helping your neighbor through many different agricultural avenues and taking this wealth of knowledge combined with her science and research background to create methods and techniques, introduce new farm practices conducive to small farmers like herself to stay viable during this economic hardship across the nation. Without further ado, I wanna turn it over to my sister um, and let her take things away. Thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for And yes, it's always a blessing to be able to share some knowledge. I am just one cog in the wheel. It is so many people around our country that want to share with us, really around the world, that want to share with us information and so forth. So I am just one of many. So I wanted to share ways of food preservation. We are really, really trying to grow as much food as we need to grow, as well as raise animals. And, and it could be small animals in the urban settings, such as rabbits and quails and ducks and smaller animals, to some of our individuals and our family and friends out there that have large acreage that can do uh, sheep, goat, cattle. But that being said, raising and, and um, growing food, we got to think about food preservation because we don't want to do this stuff. And then we got, oh my goodness, how I'm going to put it up? Where am I going to put it up? Uh, uh, how am I going to do it? Oh my goodness, now it has ruined. We can't ever get in those type of situations where we're doing all this work and then we don't know what to do, do with it from that point. That's what I'm here for. I want to assist people. Like I said, many, many other babas, mamas around the world that can help us with food preservation, but started off letting us understand where we could start and then we could get some more people involved. 
So one of the things that I have done for many, many years is bulk purchasing of dry goods. So yes, we're growing our food. Yes, we're raising our food. But then we have to think about what about our sugars, our flours, all of these different things that we don't grow ourselves. Where do you get it from? So I'm sharing with you where I utilize, where I, as a mama, do for my family is buck purchasing. I've always been in buying clubs. And this is one of the entities that I utilize. It is a organic or what I like to say, the chemical free food. And so it is an entity. Uh, they're in Oregon, but they have trucks that go all through the country. Again, um, so, um, so Sophia said, I'm in Mississippi. So you, you can imagine Oregon to Mississippi. So they do have trucks that run uh, throughout the country. So take a look at it, see if there's some drops in your area. And, and the purpose of that is your dry goods. Thinking about your rices, flour, sugar, the, uh, beans, the things that we can grow extensively. We can grow uh, we can definitely grow beans, we can grow these things, but we want to make sure we have bulk. That's the thing, bulk. You can't do uh, five pounds and this is supposed to help us, and, uh, you know, to feed us for six months. Five pounds is not going to do that. So we want to make sure we're getting enough for the family members and it, that could be a family of five, family of three, family of 10. So that's the purpose of sharing this with you as your standard.com. Next is our freezing. So most of us always think about that's the first thing. Oh, I, I can freeze. I can freeze my food. But then sometimes I've learned some from few people that we have not always the knowledge to know how to do that. And, and I was like, oh, okay. Because now we're uh, getting freezer burn. We're either putting it in uh, containers or plastic bags that are not conducive. And so now we got freezer burnt food or food that now has a, a taste to it because it was not put up properly. So one of the things is the boiler that you see on here is what most of our families call blanching, where we're, we are actually just boiling water and then we're placing those raw, fresh food in that pot. And I mean, it's a few minutes, just putting it in there, pulling it out, and then now we're moving immediately to a freezer uh, and, and we're putting it in freezer bags versus storage bags. And that's where some of our family members, our friends are making mistakes back because they're putting it in the wrong type of containers. And then if some of us may or may not even wanna use that because it's plastics. So we may wanna move to other things, but we have to be careful. One, being careful with aluminum. Aluminum do break down and yes, it breaks down and gets in your food. Now you're poisoning yourself. So we gotta make sure we're we're putting the right food, putting the food in the right containers, the right uh, tools that we need to make sure our food will be there for us. Now, freezing tips, freezing foods at zero degrees Fahrenheit or lower, freeze foods as soon as they are packed and sealed, and then leave space between the packaging um, and so forth. So those are just a few little tips. Of course, it's your is to your discretion. How do you feel you need? If you don't have a lot of freezer space, you got to do what you got to do to make sure that you're getting food put up. Now, another thing is dry canning. This is something that most of the people uh, that I've taught with and trained and worked with don't are familiar with dry canning. But again, this is for that bulk buying of your rice, beans, sugar, flour, oats, coffee, uh, and so forth, uh, 
of teas. So if you're not a coffee drinker, but you're buying um, dry tea leaves and so forth, that is what we can utilize. Um, and I would do tea leaves in, I wouldn't do tea leaves in dry canning. I would do tea, tea leaves in mylar bags, which we'll be getting to. But again, dry canning is utilizing heat. As you can see in this picture, we're looking at inside an oven. And so dry canning is uh, using heat to basically kill weevil larvae. So in dry goods, sad to say in America, because I can't speak for anywhere else, in America, when we get food, that definitely bulk food, you have uh, larvae, weevil larvae that's in that food because they're taking it from the different plants and stalks and so forth, and it's bad. Um, so, you know, large containers out in the field come into a storage facility or a packing shed, and then they're immediately put bagging it and so forth. So they're not grading it. They're not sifting it. So you're going to have the weevil larvae in the dry goods. Now, when we get these bags uh, of food to our home, and that's going to be a five pound bag up to a 50 pound bag, once you give it the right temperature, the weevil larvae now turns into a weevil. And then you open up this bag, never been opened, first time open it, and you see weevils. And everybody's like, why is weevils in our bag? The bag wasn't open. I just bought it last week at the grocery store. You gave it the right environment for the larvae to become an actual weevil. So heat Dry canning, the heat utilizing the oven kills the larvae. So you don't have that um, potential of giving we getting the weevils in your food. The other extreme is the freezing. So you could take a 50 pound bag, five pound bag, 10 or 25 and put it in your freezer for a few days and then put it up and so forth. So that is a way that you could do that um, uh, to make sure that you are not, you know, introducing weevils into your food and so forth. And so, wait, let me see. I heard, I saw that chat. I wanted to, okay. Dr. Chapman, yes, thank you for sharing that. That is something that I elders have utilized uh, dry canning for many, many years for those, like I said, the type of food that most of us don't grow a lot of. We may do some corn, we may do some beans, but we need pounds. We need 50 pounds, 100 pounds, you know, depending on the size of your family, you need bulk beans, rice, sugar, those types of things. And this is a way that that has been preserved um, in the past of our elders. That's why we got to bring it back. And that's why I'm sharing it with you all this evening. These are preservation ways of just bringing things back that have been utilized. But again, most people don't realize, um, you're welcome, you're welcome, thank you. Most people do not realize that the larvae is in dry goods. We cannot get around that just because of the way they harvest and the way they bag uh, in America, not, not saying anywhere else. I don't know what other countries do when it comes to those type of foods and dry goods that we utilize um, and so forth. Um, Baba, is everyone able to hear me? Okay, I think I can, everybody- I can hear you. We can hear you. I, okay. well, at least I know your, your sound is working. It was going in and out a little bit, oh, um, but it's, I'm it's sorry. good on this side and we are recording it. So you all will get a chance to listen to the recording as well if you miss something. Okay, Baba, you may have to turn your volume up on your particular computer or tablet you're utilizing or your phone. Everyone else is able to hear me. I hope you'll be able to hear me soon. So moving on to water bath canning. Now, most of us are familiar with water bath canning, steam canning, and, and or pressure canning. You have heard all of these throughout the years. And one of the things that we wanna keep in mind, the reason why you see these towels here, these are non-lint towels. 
this is the old way because most of us have heard that you can, you know, you have to do water bath canning correctly or you may get botulism. That is true. But the reason why you can negate that is the non-lint towel or a paper towel that's non-lint. Because I, I think I've seen some paper towels that have lint. But making sure that you're wiping the rim of your jar before you put it in the canner. Before you seal, you need to wipe that to make sure you have no food residue, no water, nothing can have a air bubble in between that ring and band. That's the purpose of the no lint or non lint towel. And that's what causes a lot of issues for many people when they're the water bath canning, they're not wiping the jars. That is very, very crucial. Um, you cannot have that air pocket, nor do you want food because the food also or water or create an air pocket and now you got stuff growing just because of heat cool how wherever you're storing your jars the t the temperature differentiation that's where you're going to get growth and we don't want that that will definitely hurt our family so water bath canning most of you all have heard of this i will share with you if it's something you have never done please please go to your extension office this is your land grant university in your state you should possibly have an extension office in your county or maybe the next county over, but they usually have a local office that's near you. Check with your extension office. They usually teach classes on water bath canning. So if you have never done it, please take a class. Do not do the YouTube, get the PhD on YouTube. Water bath canning has to be taught and you need to do it. You need to be there being able to do it where someone can watch over you and make sure you're doing the processes correctly. So please, please, please don't think you can do this off a of YouTube video. It's very dangerous to our families if you do not get it, do it correctly. Next is our root cellars. I love these. Um, I don't have one, but I've, I've I've been able to do it, see it, do it with my grandfather, utilize it, and I love these. So the root cellar, a cool storage, or a room temperature storage, most families today use their basement as a root cellar. So that's the picture on the right that you see, and useful for that because usually are built in the soil and the soil is cool. So you could do your um, root crops. And as you can see in this picture of um, fresh food, as well as the uh, canned goods. So you see that on the right. Now on the left is what most of our elders have done and are doing definitely in other countries, but they basically dig out a hill and just put a facing on it. So you have your wall facing, but when you walk into this door that is open and the back wall is soil. So that is a root cellar and that is what I'm used to seeing. So you just have a wall on the front facing, but your back wall is actually the soil that was just dug out, but that is your back wall. That's what keeps your root cellars cool and you could put all kind of food in there as well and so forth. And yes, you do need some type of door or, or some type of security where your varmints and so forth cannot get in. This, this food, of course, give off scents and animals will smell it. So you wanna make sure it's sealed, your doors are sealed and so forth when you close that door. So that smell is not coming out and inviting the varmints and animals to come in. So root cellars are very good for root crops. That's basically what they were built for, root crops, all root crops. But now, as you can see, a lot of people uh, utilize their basement because of the temperature and they put everything down there. Got a question? I do, I do. Um, when when people are building these root cellars or they, they're constructing them, do they typically use like a wire mesh against that, that soil wall for anything that might want to dig in? Or you don't really have to worry about that on that back side? 
That's a good question. Now, in the past, and, and you know, we're talking about a good, you know, 20, 30, 40 years back. In the past, our elders did not put mesh, but things are changing. Um, sad to say, just like a lot of people are hungry in our country, animals are getting hungry too. It's, things have just changed for us access to food. And so that may be the case and that that's life. We have to change with what is going on in our environment. So very, very good question. I It's a trial and error. And if you start seeing animals or seeing boreholes or little things, then you would have to put up mesh. But in the past, no, that it was just a blank soil wall, um, you know, 40 plus years ago. Thank you for the question. That's good. That's a good question too. Because I would think now, yeah, you probably need to put up mesh. It's a lot of hungry animals, sad to say. No, no food are, are, is readily available like it used to be. Any other questions so far on anything, not just this slide? Any other questions? Any other questions? All righty. We'll move forward. So the Mylar bags are... I love these. <laughs> and this again is the bulk, buying in bulk and then being able to store them. Now, it's to your liking and to your discretion if you want to do a mylar bag and, and put it in the five gallon bucket, as you see. Most of us use the, the five gallon bucket just to keep the mylar bag upright. But I do know many, many families utilize that to keep the mylar bag upright, but also keep their food in that five gallon bucket. And then the picture on the lower left is your gamma seal lid. That is what you use on the five gallon bucket to seal it for one, uh, you know, trying to making it airtight, but no sense, no food sense or anything is coming out of that bucket to bring varmints and so forth. So the right pit, the right lower picture is basically that. That is your mylar bag, and then you have um, your your oxygen. Oh, what's the word? I always forget that word. <laughs> um, but it's the oxygen out of the bag once you put the food in there. And forgive me for, for forgetting. I know most of you probably know that name, but I always forget that second word that go with that. But it's helping to pull the oxygen out of the bag. Mylar bags are uh, sealed with either uh, our iron, like the way we iron our clothes, that's the easiest or you seal it with your, your heat. When um, you're sealing your meat bags, when people put up meat and they have the little two, the apparatus that you can seal your bag that way. So you could do it either or. Um, is it a vacuum pack? Is it a vet? Yeah, but it's a name for it, oxygen something. But it's, it's pulling the oxygen. You don't want oxygen in your bag. And so you, you know, manually try to get as much oxygen out, but you put these in to get the rest out. <laughs> so that's what it is. You don't want any oxygen in your bag when you're preserving food. You don't want that. Um, and so, okay, um, Mama Khadija said, where can we get bags, seal, and buckets? Um, so let me put, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Let me get the spelling. So Lehman's is a company and you could do a search. This is an old country store and you can do online orders, but Lehman's still have the old stuff, things that we utilized many, many, many years ago. They still have that stuff. So it's like an old country store, but huge. It's a big, big store. So Lehman's, and then you also can get this from the Azure Standard. So that was my first slide. And I know Mama Khadija was in here, but I'll put it again for others that come in a little late. The Azure Standard is also where we buy, I buy my bulk food at, but then I also uh, buy these bags and the oxygen um, packs. So Azure Standard. Um, but thank you for sharing I, that, that Amazon is running out. Um, but I, I always like going to these other companies to, 
just because you you they know what you need, especially these old country store type things. They know what you need. It's not a fake Mylar bag because those are out there. Um, and, and fake meaning the scent of the food is coming through the bag. That's not a Mylar bag. Mylar bag seals. So it's kind of like the, um, oh, shoot. The the dry food or the dehydrated food that the military use, that's that's basically what you're utilizing. A mylar bag is is that way. You don't smell that food before you put a hot water in that bag, you know. So that is a mylar bag. <laughs> you cannot smell the food, and that's why um, if you're keeping food for six months, a year, two, three years, you need a mylar bag. No fake bags. If you can smell the food, that is not a mylar bag. So just sharing that and again, utilizing the five gallon bucket if you want more protection, but use the gamma seal. So, uh, because it, a gamma seal is a twist. It twists onto the bucket. It's not just the tops that you have at Lowe's or Home Depot that you just push down. Ants will get in that, you know? So it's, it's just making sure um, the smell, the scent and varmints cannot get to your food. All right, next, any, okay, let's see, is it a question? Oh, now I don't know that if they ship internationally. Please, please check with them. I cannot answer that question if, if Lehman ship internationally. I don't know that, I'm sorry. Um, that's gonna be hard on Amazon versus our that's why I would say Lehman's and Azure, because Amazon, sad to say, they get things from other countries, not going to name those countries, that they just are not of quality. They're not of quality. They look like a Mylar bag, but they're not. And, and that's one reason why I don't buy on Amazon. It's just so much stuff on there that are, is not high quality and of standard they're they're imitating things and yeah but they're charging you the same price so i i wouldn't oh good good they do ship internet great thank you for sharing that thank you that is wonderful um but no don't do trial and error we're not spending money on fake just go to the people that you can trust <laughs> just go go to lehman's as your standard as your standard is no cost to join them it's free you only paying for the goods that you are putting in your cart that is it so you is no you know no buying club fee and all of that mess no 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 so Thank you for putting that link in. Thank you so much. So yes, go to the people that you could trust. And I have bought these bags on our and are using these bags. And so that's why I say go to the people you could trust and know that they will work. Now, dehydration. Um, I am very huge on dehydration, especially like ones of us that have children at home. Um, you know, most of us been doing that for many, many years when it comes to fruit. Uh, for our children. But the one thing I want to add is the top picture. If we move into a situation where we don't have electricity, you have to have a solar generator. Please, please, please do not get caught up in this game of just getting a gas generator. If the electricity go out, the gas pumps go out. People forget that. The gas pumps are electric. How you turn them on is electric. We do not, unless you're in a rural, rural little country town, that's the only place you're gonna find the, the old school gas uh, pumps that only thing you gotta get up there and do is move the lever and the gas will come out. That's rural, rural areas in the cities and large metropolitan areas or near metropolitan areas, they no longer have the old school pumps that the gas is going to come out without electricity. So please do not get caught up in that. If lights go out over a city, over a large area, you're, you're not gonna be able to get gas for your generator. So solar generators is what I'm telling people to get for these type of uh, equipment, our little small kitchen equipment that we need. 
blenders, our dehydrators, those types of things that, you know, they're, they're not, the, the equipment is not solar itself. So that means you got to find a way to get it heating. And that's where I sell solar generator. Um, well, in Senegal, most of, well, I've worked in Ghana, but most of the country, especially the farmers are building um, their solar uh, dehydrators. Um, no, you said solar generators. Uh, that's probably, that's probably going to have to be shipped or, yeah at least the generator itself possibly be shipped. But I'm trying to see with so many stuff getting shipped in from Europe, is some generators in Africa. Because when I saw the different things coming from France and coming from China, just the seeds, it's, it's generators there, it's solar generators there. And the dehydrators, now the dehydrators, that I saw were built by the farmers themselves. They were built um, it, with plans, like it was a solar dehydrator plan to build it out of wood. And I'm, I'm getting ready to show you one too. But the, the farmers or the community people built their own and so forth. Um, but please, please touch bases with me if you need, you know, like how to get it um, um, to shipped and stuff, so forth. So yes, I got you. Um, definitely. I, I would probably say get it shipped in. Um, thank you for putting that link. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, because yeah, it's difficult to really know what's there, but to be honest, I think they really would be there. Uh, you'd be surprised what's, what's in our various African countries. It's stuff there, but you, you know, you gotta find it. You just gotta find it, but it's there. So yeah, the solar generator with the dehydrator, that's something that I would just please, please get that. Don't just get your kitchen equipment and different things you need and, um, and think that you don't need some type of power. You'll always be able to rely on electricity. That's, that's not going to be the case. All right, next is our uh, DIY solar dehydrators. So these ones, the lower left is the ones that I have seen in Africa, the lower left, the ones that they do the panel on the side, and then you have your trays coming this way. So the sun is going in this way, and that bottom piece is where the air, the heat is going from, because heat rises, so the heat is going in that bottom section of wood and then going up through that box. So those are the ones that I usually see in Africa. I have seen the top left as well in various countries, but these are DIY. And then the lower middle, that was at Walmart. That's just mesh. And then you got, you got your little trays of food in there. And I was like, wow, that's pretty neat. Um, just made out of mesh and so forth um, and so forth. So yeah, that, that's something, a DIY solar dehydrator. Again, you can find plans online. They're everywhere. They are everywhere um, to build to your liking. Um, and But it's really, and I think a lot of us can get a hold of glass panes. Um, a lot of times people, uh, you they'll leave them in landfills sometimes people will stack them up near the buildings. Sometimes you have stores and entities in your area that take um, um, excess building equipment from contractors. So you could go to those different uh entities and get window panes and so forth so it's it's I, I don't i wouldn't just go out and buy window panes too many places that you possibly can get it so any questions okay not so next is our refrigeration and you see that i got cook stuff on here so refrigeration we know we're gonna do refrigeration that you know we go out to our gardens, we, we grab that food, we're harvesting that food, our excess goes in the refrigerator. Again, if the lights go out for a period of time, 
That's why I have these pictures on there. You need to cook your food. <laughs> I don't, I would have really, really, I cannot understand is we have in us to put up food. Like that is innately in us to put up food. We have thousand dollars, thousands of dollars worth of food in our freezers. But when the lights go off for a week or two, we'll just say, oh, I, the fruit is going to ruin. I have never understood that because it's like you have taken months, sometimes years to put that food in the freezer. And then you just kind of like, okay, lights off. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, I would be calling everybody and walking down the street asking people, I would not let that food go to waste. But that's why I'm here to help people understand what to do. Um, two, three days, you're good. Just don't open your freezer. I've noticed how people will go to the refrigerator, go to the freezer and just open it up when the lights go off. If you don't need to go to the refrigerator freezer, do not open the door. That keeps the air in. As soon as you heat in, now things start thawing out. And so please, please, please keep the doors closed until you definitely have to utilize something out of that um, equipment. So please do not open the refrigerator, do not open the freezer when lights go out to dire need uh, and so forth. So again, it'll last for two, three days. A lot of times it'll last going into your fourth, fifth day if you do not open the doors. But past that, now we need to start thinking about what I need to do. Most people, most families have grills. Start cooking the food. Just start cooking the food. Use your jars, use your containers in your home to put that cooked food in and so forth. But don't let it ruin. Just start cooking the food. So that's why the grill is there. Another um, opportunity to, to help preserve uh, frozen food when it starts thawing out is a smoker start smoking your food, turn it into a dehydrated meat. And so that's jerky. Your smoker can do that. So turn it into something that still could be utilized, but you're not losing the food. So again, if the lights go out, cook or smoke all of your food before ruining. Do not let it get to that point where now you're trying to cook hundreds of pounds of food. Cook as you need if you're past a week's time that your lights are off. Any questions on that? Any questions? Any questions? Now, you saw this smoker, okay? If you don't have that, that's fine. You see the grill, um, you know, that that's fine. If you don't have a grill, you don't have a smoker, we move into the DIY. Uh, uh, stuff. So this is a smoker that's done around the world. So this is nothing that I just come up with and, you know, oh, here are pictures and I'm just going to throw them on here. Like, no, we have utilized these types of smokers uh, if you don't have the, the smoker that I just showed to you. So you're utilizing the branches from trees. And as you can see, you put it over a fire pit or some type of uh, fire area that you have on your property, or you make a fire area. You don't have to have a fire pit. Just contain the fire. You can use bricks. You can use wood. You have wood. Most of us can get access to wood. But now what does that mean you have to have? You got to have an ax. You got to have a chainsaw. You see what I'm saying? Now chainsaw, you got to have gas for that, or you got the battery operated chainsaw. But now you got to start thinking, what are the tools I need to cut the branches that move you into another level? So now we have the branches. And as you can see, it's just placed over um, the fire and it's, it's connected at the top with twine. You could use, you could figure it out, zip ties, whatever you have, shoelaces. Don't stress about how to put the stuff together. It's just folding it over and then fig figuring it out, whatever you have. Figure it out on how to keep it upright. And then on the right, that's utilizing tarp. You're using like, like tarp to keep the smoke in. So utilizing any type plastic material, silage tarp, a lot of us are urban, like the, it's urban farmers on here, you can use a silage tarp. When you're in dire need, cut the tarp. 
cut the side of char. Don't think about it. If you need food, you need to smoke your food cut the tarp to make it fit your uh, branches and so forth. And, it, and just seal it up because you overlap it and that's it. You want to keep the smoke in and at the top, it is the smoke is going to go out, but on your sides, you're um, lapping it over or flapping that over. So there's no smoke coming out your sides, just that top. And that's it. That's all it is. That's your DIY smoker. And then inside you, the branches where down here at the bottom where it's open, you could utilize uh, other little twigs and branches and you could tie them on and you lay your meat over. So you still using wood all in that portion. And that's how you smoke your meat. Um, you lay it over. If you're, a, if you're very good at engineering it, that can hold weight then you may have something, you know, in your home, you could be at, bring out there like a metal uh, a tray or something like that, that could put the meat on that it can start dehydrating a little bit faster, uh, but it has to be able to hold the weight and so forth. So that open space that you see right above the fire area, that's where you could put branches across and that holds your food. So you can just uh, cut up thin slices, thin slice your meats and hang it over, turn it into jerky. So that's how you're able to preserve that um, meat if it, your refrigerator freezer go out or no electricity. Any questions? Let me jump up here. Yes, yes, yes. So the length of time is based upon the thickness of your meat. So I can't tell you that. It's based upon how thick you cut the meat, but everybody, most of us have eaten jerky. So you, it's no moisture, it's dehydrating the meat. So that's how long it has to be, it's jerky. So it's gonna have, you know, <laughs> it's gonna have to pull really hard, you know, and so forth, but it's no moisture, De it's dehydrating meat. That's what smokers do. So we know dehydrating of fruits and vegetables. Now smoker is dehydration of meat. That's all it is. So uh, making sure if it's still, um, what you call it, uh, flexible, chewy, it's, it's not done. If, it's, if you can bend it, it's not done. It's, it's too chewy. It, it, it has to be where you can break. You pull in it and it breaks or you're using your teeth and you have to pull, but it's a clean break. No moisture is in it then. Good question. Thank you. That was a good question. Any other questions? Any other questions? I believe in DIY stuff. <laughs> we could do that very easily. Now, freeze drying. Oh, it's a question. Come on. Come on, Miss Mitchell. You have a question? Did you raise your hand? Huh? Huh? You just unmuted. <laughs> okay. All right. Freeze drying is next. Uh, again, this is if we are able, we have our electricity and so forth, and we can use these type of equipment to freeze dry our food. So a different way of dehydration, but from cold, not heat. So that's all freeze drying is. But again, if you have electricity, you have this type of equipment, um, do it. I mean, it doesn't hurt. It's, it's just you're dehydrating your food to keep your food. And it's your discretion if it's going to be cold or hot dehydration. How are you going to do it? So I'm just giving examples and it'd be to your discretion what's easier for you. But freeze drying is another way of, of dehydrating our food, just utilizing coldness versus heat. Any questions on that? All right. Now, fermentation, a lot of us um, are familiar with this definitely from grandparents, parents. A lot of them would do sauerkraut. Um, I love kimchi. I love sauerkraut. I love fermented food. But that is good for us, but it's also a good preservation, food preservation to do fermentation. So you, of course, you're preserving your food, is enriching the palate of flavors, allowing a better assimilation of your food when you do that, because I 
probiotics are good bacteria. It helps with that good help with digestion because of uh, ferment because of the good bacteria and fermentation. And then of course it can enrich intestines with living microorganisms. That's our good bacteria. So please, please. Oh yes, chow chow. Yes. We got so many good fermenting foods, but again, it's a prep. See, we eat it readily and it comes to us and we enjoy it on a daily basis. And we're able to go to our favorite stores and buy it, but we're not thinking that that is a way of food preservation when we don't have our refrigeration uh, and so forth. So yes, fermentation is a good way to be able to preserve our food. Now, preserving is salt and sugar. A lot of people don't think about this, but this is a way. Um, definitely a lot of our African brothers and sisters do the salted fish and salted meat. They do salted meat, but most of us hear about the salted fish, uh, but that's preservation. That is preservation, the purpose of doing that. And so we could do that here. Uh, and we have done that here. My grandfather did that. And so again, all of these traditions been handed down and I love it, but we got to move back to it. So preserving our food in salt and, and, and or sugar, um, please do not use synthetic sugar. Uh, if you're going to use sugar, I would do salt. That's, that's all I know is preserving meats and salt. Um, but I do know people have utilized sugar, but just, you know, don't go get synthetic sugar. Please, please, please don't do that. We want to use our natural sugars, uh, our cane sugars, um, you know, any, even um, um, we can do our, the inner part of our um, coconut and did doing sweeteners, it's many things, stevia, it's natural things that grow <laughs> that we could utilize the sugars off of it. So please don't do synthetic sugar. Uh, you're just messing your meat up, please don't do that. So salted uh, meats, not just fish, you can salt your various meat and that's curing. That's what we know is curing, um, but we can utilize that as preservation. Um, we know that is uh, ex you know, chefs and, and exclusive restaurants that do the cured meat uh, is palates around the world that like uh, different meats uh, that have been cured for months and years and so forth. And so that's all we're doing is preservation. They are preserving because the bottom right, that's what's going on inside of restaurants. <laughs> They're hanging meat. They have areas, those sellers, root sellers, um, they're hanging meat for those palace in their restaurant, their clientele that like that cured meat. Now we just got to bring that home, do that same type of preservation at home. So again, not only fish, but you can do other meats as well. All right, immersion and alcohol. Uh, so again, this is the canning, but fresh, and then doing uh, pouring your uh, warm alcohol. And then my next slides have the vinegar and so forth, but uh, you could do that as well. Um, again, still wiping your lid now, even though you're not doing um, maybe not the water bath on some of foods that you can can, because yes, it is canning without water bath is canning not, and it's you know, not dry canning. You could not utilize heat or water, and that's heat and water with the water bath, it is canning that you can do that's just putting your fresh vegetables in there and then you're utilizing the preservation of alcohol, olive oil, and vinegar. That's what you're utilizing to preserve your food. So you could do that, but again, always wipe your jar. Please, please don't ever forget to wipe your jar. So immersion in alcohol, and they're utilizing like white wine vinegar. That's what you're um, uh, utilizing, white wine, I'm sorry, but utilizing that to um, do your preservation. So that's immersion in alcohol. And again, to your discretion, some people do that, some don't. Some don't want the alcohol, they want to use other preservatives, and that's where we um, move into the um, the vinegar and the olive oil, preserving it in that way. Um, now, 
that's a question I, I cannot answer for as the, the proof and the content. That's why I pulled the white wine. That's what most people utilize. But me, myself, I don't know the proof or anything like that. I don't know how much alcohol is in the white wine. Um, but that is what most people utilize when they immerse uh, in alcohol is the white wine. So yeah, just giving you the example of that. Now, next again is uh, vinegar, uh, what we know as the vinegar pickling and so forth, but you utilize in vinegar. Um, again, as you can see, we can, <laughs> we can pickle anything. <laughs> and this is basically a basic recipe for pickling spices. I, I know we have pickling spices that we can buy, but I'm really skeptical of the brands that put out pickling spices. And so I always would like for people to try to do their own, make your own pickling spice. Like here is many, many, you know, the recipes are out there. Uh, many recipes are out there because people tweak it based upon their taste. Um, but I would get a recipe and just buy those herbs and put together. So you have your jar of the pickling spice and they're there for you. You're not worrying about trying to go to the grocery store or anything like that. I would really, really just ask people to create their own pickling spice. It's just the brands. I, I don't trust the brands. And that's me, not everybody. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Pickling really but again, most of us forget that is preservation. Vinegar preserves our so utilizing that when we get in dire need um, and need to, to put up our food, that's what we can utilize. All right, next is the immersion in olive oil. And so most of us know how to do like um, different herbal oils that we utilize for like uh, massage, rubbing oils that a lot of us are make ourselves. Um, I utilize rosemary oil. Uh, it helps with pain. <laughs> rosemary oil is very good for pain those days that you have worked very, very hard and your muscles are screaming. <laughs> rosemary oil works really, really well. So uh, just immersing rosemary oils and it don't always have to be olive oil but the i always said the best oils so please no canola no oil just being transparent no cheap oil you got to get higher up level up get those great oils uh those are the best um for uh, pulling the benefits out of our herbs, pulling the benefits, uh, benefits of, of that medicinal out of our vegetables and so forth. So just go good, go, go, go all in <laughs> and get the best oils. And then see, I have olive oil on here and I don't use, I utilize olive oil. So the only way I would use, uh, uh, utilize olive oil, I'm going into an olive oil store. That is the only way I'm going to use olive oil. I will not whatsoever use olive oil from a Walmart, Kroger's, Publix, Vows, whatever grocery store that's local. It's too, well, olive oil have been tested by other countries and it's corn oil. It's majority corn oil, it's not olive oil that's being sold to the masses. So if you're gonna use olive oil, please go to a olive oil store, a specialized store and buy olive oil. But please go, you know, the high end oils, more expensive, but you can trust it. And then you know that your food is preserved. All right, let me look at the chat. Yes, there is a lot of fake olive oil. Yep. Yeah, please be careful with that. Just, just don't do mass. Don't go to the main stores and buy olive oil. It's, yeah, please do not do that. So utilize an immersion of oil. So not just olive oil, again, using various oils uh, to immerse your vegetables. Um, utilize that and your herbs. That's another way of preservation. So these are two of my references, the home food preservation from commonsensehome.com. Um, and then I, all of these images, of course, came from Google just to be able to share with you. I love working off of pictures um, so people can actually see what I'm talking about and so forth. So again, commonsensehome.com and it was their home food preservation 
little article that I pulled from some of these ideas. A lot of them I knew, but I wanted to make sure I got as many opportunities to assist you all. Um, so that and questions. This is my contact information. Please reach out. I'm always here. Um, and I always tell people this is my destiny. I sleep, drink, uh, talk, work, agriculture. This is what I do on a daily basis. So please, when I put the cell phone number on there, that does not mean you cannot call me. I, I don't mind people calling. That is a business number. Uh, so please reach out when you have questions and so forth or want to discuss things. Uh, I am very open to that. Networking, I am a conduit. Um, I uh, like to put people together when I don't know I have the network around the country and out of the country to connect the dots uh, for your questions and, and concerns and so forth. So please just reach out to me to get that assistance when it comes to agriculture. Ah, thank you for sharing that. Certified Organic California Olive Oil or Organic Olive Oil from Israel. Now, are you asking me which oil? Can you, can you unmute yourself? Do you mind? Are you asking me a question or are you sharing that with us, those types of oils? Just sharing the information. Those are the olive oils that are known to be actual olive oil. Because Thank coming you. from Spain and Italy and other countries, those are, like you said, not may not next necessarily be olive oil. Thank you so much, Mama. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Wow. See, we always have wealth of information. Always wealth of information. I love that. And thank you all for sharing, uh, interacting with me in the chat. That's what I love. Um, I will never say I know it all because none of us do. Um, and and I we have these platforms so we can share and so forth because we don't know who knows what? And so when the mamas and babas get on here and share information, take that information and run with it, utilize it, reach out to them and so forth. So uh, again, thank y'all for just interacting with me. that in the talking, sharing your knowledge with everybody on here. So I will turn it back over to mama. Thank you so much, you all. Mama Athena, Mama Raina. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Y'all know I'm I'm juggling these little ones, so there, there's likely going to be some noise. I learned something new. I know I will definitely be applying it um, to our family farm. I am just so grateful for you. You know, this is one of the things that we do within, within Black Sustainability is just connect with our family members that know and are doing this. She's dedicated her time and energy to be here. Um, I would strongly encourage you all to look, learn more. What is it? Bit.ly slash RDS farm. Um, you know, I know you do a lot of other classes and courses. I know I don't have my big dogs. It's a little messy here, but I'm going to do it anyway. We've got, uh, <laughs> give me a second. We, um, we are just honored and thankful to have you here um, with us. And I would just encourage everybody to do what they can to support. I don't know if you have any um, products coming out or want to share anything that's happening on the farm. I know that we kind of went through it. And if anybody has questions, you know, now is the time. But I did want to leave space for you to just share anything else that you wanted to promote to, uh, to the network. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, please, please. I want questions. I, I have plenty of time. You know, long as Mama Raina has got the Zoom open, we could talk. <laughs> so I don't mind that. So I'm not rushing anybody off. I really have the time. But thanks you for letting me share. So one of the things is the sons. I always promote them and push them out there because that is the next generation. So I do have three sons. The oldest um, is uh, in to this year be 30 and he does farm infrastructure so he goes around and help our farmers and yes he can move around it's not that he has to stay in Mississippi we like helping each other and so he helps you put like water lines down for your drip irrigation water lines down for your chickens you know have running water to chickens and rabbits and so for things like that. Uh, and it is legal. When we put water lines down for agriculture, you do not have to be permitted. 
but now he cannot do any water lines to go to your home shed. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> but we can go to any out space, outdoor space for agriculture only. Um, repair fencing. So ones of you that are a little larger, larger acreage when it comes to actual farms, not necessarily backyards, he helps with farm repair of buildings, you know, helping, because most of the time I work with elders, I'm working with 60 plus year old men and women that sometimes their body starts ailing them. And so they have farmed their whole life, but now they can't get on a ladder, getting on the roof, fixing nothing. And so that's where I said. And my child up there, I'm not getting up there either. <laughs> and so we want to make sure we share that with you that he's there to assist. The middle son will be 17 in a few days, six days. Um, and he does vegan donuts. He's the baker of the family. Um, and so he assists with the vegan sweet treats. Um, his specialty is donuts, but we're moving and moving him into other different type of sweet treats. But right now, vegan donuts. And the last little baby, he'll be 10 in two days. Um, he does cut flowers. So we're moving into cut flowers and so forth. So beautifying your home, beautifying, you know, event spaces you have and stuff like that. So I always like to push the boys. That's the first thing. So that's a mama's duty, push your children. <laughs> and then last, please, please um, check me out, contact me. I do many, many, many workshops. So please just stay in contact with me, um, reach out to me. I really, if anybody is willing to assist me and help me with doing newsletters, I don't do newsletters, uh, but maybe helping me get on a platform where I could copy and paste and stuff. And that's our platform, but I forget about our stuff. I really forget about shooting it over and I know a lot of people have helped me with that they'll see it and then they'll drop it on black sustainability and I'm like thank you because I always forget but we have our platform uh, but I definitely like a newsletter where it's just dates and times with help and location um, I do a lot of workshops around the country and so definitely would love to see a lot of you all in the place and sometimes definitely I'm coming to your area and close and you can possibly drive an hour or so to me if I'm in the next city over or so forth. So yes, please just reach out so I can share with you the upcoming stuff. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see a few things in the chat. I know we are going over just a little bit. Um, so 704, but if anybody has any questions, just go ahead and unmute um, and ask the questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, I have a question about... Um... I'm really interested in doing more fermenting. Um, so I was wondering if you had like, I know you spoke a little bit about it, but do you provide workshops on that? Or do you have any like recommendations in terms of what you find easiest to ferment outside of like kombucha um, or even best, pack, best practices with kombucha that you found to yield or um, a good success for you? Mm -hmm. So the elders have always utilized uh, the cabbage. Cabbage is so good, you know, with our, uh, the chow chow moving into, um, oh shoot, what did I say? Not the kim the kimchi is that, oh, sauerkraut. sauerkraut. So mm -hmm. yeah, really moving into those things. It's to your liking, but what I suggested is if, if learning to do it better or learning how to do it, your land grant institution, the extension offices usually have a bulletin and or they teach classes mm, okay. in your local areas. But see, we got to utilize them. They, mm -hmm. they just be sitting mm -hmm. up in the office every day, but they, <laughs> they, are, they are there to, they supposed to be going out in a community and teaching these classes. Right. That's that's what they that's their job title. But now I know for a fact you could go in there because um, most of them have commercial kitchens in the extension office and they are do a class there. Um, so it's just really getting uh, commute few of the community ladies, um, some of the bobbles that want to learn that and go into your local extension office. Mm, OK. Yeah. And then if you know if you get pushback again, everybody has a boss. 
So you yeah. go up the ladder because that is their job to do, to teach those type of methodologies, the, the water uh, bath canning, and then the fermentation. Those are things that they know uh, how to do and supposed to train on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Any other questions? So I did see the question in the chat about uh, the the growing domes. Um, Ms. Mitchell, can you unmute yourself? What can you share a little bit more? Are you talking about one close to the ground? Or are you talking about the domes that actually people live in? Like the, not the yurts, but yeah, the actual domes. Can you share? Yes, hi, greetings everyone. Um, yes, I'm looking for uh, either learning how to um, build a growing dome. And it's, it's right now my son and I, my 19 year old son and I, we expatted to Senegal and we're doing sustainable living um, projects here. And we thought that it's, especially in the areas where um, the soil is not that great, we were wanting to either create or figure out a way um, to find out which growing domes would be good for those areas that don't have good um, soil and um, people could uh, grow different, um, you know, fruits and vegetables outside of their usual season. So that's what we were asking about. Oh, I got you. So, um, like the high tunnels and the greenhouses here in America, I don't, Oh, if that plastic will hold up to the heat. I don't think so either. That's why I was asking. <laughs> yep. And then growing domes. Mm, I would, if it was me, I would get with the elders and or some of the university, like the okay. quote unquote, the land grant, the people that is because it's universities there in synagogue that do the agriculture. I would get with them because they will have the ancestral knowledge of that. Okay. What will okay. work in Senegal? Because, yeah, shipping things over, our plastic is not going to hold up to the UV rays of Senegal. That's, that's yeah. no. And so I would really get with somebody there that, that really could. Now, if you don't mind me asking, are you connected with Made in Africa with RJ? Are you familiar with him no. in Senegal? No, I'm not familiar with him. Ah, uh, you yeah, we we gotta connect. Um, that's okay. our that's our brother. He's his family is in Atlanta. Um, that's where he's from. Um, and he's been there for years. He he went to school there and, and when he was in high school, but now he's married, children, and they're there, and he is doing some awesome things in Senegal. But RJ will be able to help you connect to the university people. That's why I thought of them first. So um, if you don't mind shooting me an email, um, let me, and then I could connect you all. Okay, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Let me put my email address again in the chat, the rdsfarm at gmail.com. Yeah, we could definitely connect you up with him and, and it'll be nice to even know him, know him, because it's a, yeah, it's quite a, it's a lot of, people in Senegal right now from America. So it'd be good to even connect with him to meet other people. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions, comments, suggestions on whatever, what else would you like for me to teach? I always like asking that question. So Mama Raina and I can get it on the books. <laughs> What you... teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I know. What else do you all need to learn in this time? Like what we're going through now in America, what is your like dire need? Like I need to know this yesterday. Could you share that with me? Um, I have a question. Would you be interested in doing like how to workshops? So like, um, you know, like providing like a supply list and then us walking through the process of preserving any one of the methods that you presented like have you would you be open to doing something like that like more of a demonstration type I can <laughs> I'm hesitating because yeah I travel so much I'm not here but 
my sons can help me. Um, how I would like to do it if it could be pre-recorded and mm. then I can get on live, we, we play it and then I'm here to answer questions. Right, I would right. prefer to do it that way because then I can do it at, when I have time, my leisure, the boys can record me doing it. Right, um, right. And then I can I can go from there. I, I know I don't mind doing it. It's just I don't want to get locked into trying to do a live one because I'm not set up technology wise to do that, uh, right. to be able to do a live demonstration. Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you for that. I was just curious. You're welcome. You're quite now. I, I heard you say how to for us food preservation. Is it any other how to's? Um, and I heard you say supply list. So now supply list, you can email me to get, you know, specifics. Like if it's seed companies or, you know, please email me, you know, direct and I can give you that now. We don't have to wait for a class or anything. <laughs> but is it like, is it other how to that you need? No, um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not to take up so much time, but I thought it was really helpful. Like in this particular workshop that you provided resources that people can directly go to. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that's like, that'll be a workshop or something, but that was, that is particularly useful. Um, okay. Well, I will tell you, you know, supply lists, names of people is extensive. And I would, I would like to know exactly. It's not that I can't give it all to you, but I like to always start with what you need first. So if it's seed companies, Verma composting, uh, rainwater barrels, like if, if you all can send me emails, then I can, I can create a list. And so we at least have a one pager starting out. And as that, I can keep adding to that list as people want stuff. Um, cause when you all give me questions like that, I, it's, it's so much too broad. Yes. yes, too too broad. Broad. <laughs> yes, yes. It's too broad. I always hone it in for me and then I can get it out to you faster. Um, mm -hmm. and so forth. Cause I like turning things over quickly, get it to you as quick as possible. I give it, get it to mama Raina and, or her, uh, uh, staff and volunteers. I could get it to them in a few days when it's compact. If you, I need five things. Okay. I can get those five things to you and so forth. So every, and this goes to everyone, um, shoot me an email and I can start compiling that one pager, uh, for you. Um, and then we just keep adding to it. It could be an Excel sheet and I, we just keep adding to it as people need. Yeah, I, I think so. And if you do get requests, I would ask if you could just forward them. Cause one thing I've been doing is putting them to the database and then just sharing that back out for resources that people can access, even if they miss the calls, okay. um, like a food forest plant list or garden planning, you know, like how much you need. You were talking earlier about how to prepare for your family. Um, I have a few um, spreadsheets I want to share with you to get your thoughts on. Okay. To get okay. your thoughts on around just like the accuracy of, of that as we scale for family members, you know, what you put in, if you have, if you're growing kale and garlic and you have five family members, you know, what these numbers need to look like versus what you need to Mm -hmm. I got you. I understand. Yes, please shoot that to me. Um, Cause that, see, that's yeah. So we basically need to create a folder. So we we just need a folder with with uh, that's on the platform where I, where we can dump things, and then like I said, home, what will hone me in better to get it started and I can do it in a timely manner is the questions. As, as you all send me, I need this, then I can start the Excel sheet that's in the folder. And as questions key, I know that I can always go to that folder, open it up and keep adding. And then all other mamas and babas can do that. And then now we'll have a really, really extensive list. That would be yeah, we definitely could do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. Thank you. Yeah, that's see, teamwork. Because <laughs> we don't always think of these things, but 
we need them. We, but it's just so much we're trying to do to help one another. The small things sometimes get overlooked. And that's why we, we're we grateful when you all ask questions, when you make suggestions, because it's not that we don't want to do it. A lot of times we just look over because it's so minute um, in our day-to-day. -day. Not minute for as important, but it's mm -hmm. just minute in our day-to-day. -day. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that um, when you think about getting more of our people to think and live in a way that is sustainable long term in a real practical way like food, what are some of the barriers that prevent them from taking action? And just, you know, like even when I'm thinking about like starting my stuff, like Amazon was my go to place. But now I'm like, I have two additional sources that I can use. So I think that. Um, yeah, I think that creating this sort of document, this living document will be really, really helpful for our folks. Okay, I definitely, I can do that. Oh, you're welcome. That's easy, easy. I can do that. <laughs> yes, that's so easy. And I definitely, I remember, I always remember the buying club because we have, most of us have families and buying a one pound bag at our grocery store and it's, six to ten dollars for one pound of seasoning or whatever and and sad to say a lot of times we can't even get a one pound bag in our grocery store now it's ounces but we're paying ten dollars for ounces my thing is why can't we do buying clubs um and or eight our buying clubs create our own buying clubs um that we you know somebody in our area and we say okay i'm going to be the pinnacle person the one that you can come to in our community we know there's mamas and babas that are busy they don't have time to go on the website and order but you can say well i can buy the 50 pound bag of beans you all just come over we break the bag down you know, we we have done that as well over the years and stuff um, and affordability. Some of our families cannot afford to buy a 50 pound bag, but they can afford a five pound or a one pound bag. We can break that down. So just thinking outside of the box to be able to do these types of things. So buying clubs have my go to for uh, children at home. If you have children at home, uh, buying in bulk is the way to go as, as well as growing your own food. But like Mama Raina was saying, knowing how much food to grow uh, to for bulk, like you need growth in, in, in bulk, but you got to know how much to, to grow and so forth. So definitely I can assist with that where we can get that um, on the platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? If not, you know, if all hearts and minds are clear, I'm going to stop the recording so we can save this for later. And um, let me do that. And just say thank you again, just major gratitude.